So good afternoon. It's my pleasure to introduce our uh, currently junior fellow, Dr. Brandy Musselman, um, who's going to talk to us today about fibroids, uh, uteri, and morselation. Um, we have this talk on the docket since, I want to say, March or April of this year. Um, Brandy first gave a version of this talk in February in, the, in Center City, Philadelphia. Um, and I have to be honest with you and say that I feel like it, we, we should have called it off at 11 a.m. updating ourselves because if, if we wait minute by minute, this talk would have had to been updated minute by minute um, for the last six to nine months. Um, so uh, she will get through to current day uh, status, uh, but please be patient because she wants to update everybody who's not familiar with the current issues or concerns um, and what we're talking about. Brandy is a native Pennsylvanian. She was born uh, close to Free College in Warren Springs. Uh, she met her current husband while she was in elementary school, so <laughs> that may have not made it too far. Um, she uh, did her undergraduate studies at Juniata College, and in preparation for today's talk, she majored in politics. She uh, continued her education thereafter at Drexel with a master's in uh, with a master's degree, followed by medical school and uh, residency, and now for fellowship. So it's a true pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Brandy Musselman. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Dr. McKay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's so great to be here today. Thank you for having me. And actually, it's been wonderful being here for the past nine months. So I really appreciate um, the warm welcome I have received the entire time. So like Dr. Mackay said, we're going to be talking to you about tissue extraction and GYN surgery, um, specifically removal of fibroids, the uterus, and uh, morselation. So I'll be just briefly going over tissue removal and GYN surgery. Then we'll get into the meat of the talk. Um, I'll get into the morselation controversy um, as we know it. Um, we'll review the actual facts, the data that we do know, and actually what don't we know, which there's quite a lot that we don't know. Um, and then we'll just briefly touch on um, what she would, we should do from here on out. So when you remove some tissue from the body, there's specific goals that you should keep in mind. You want your method of tissue retrieval to be safe for the patient. You want to ensure complete removal of your specimen. You want to prevent spillage if possible. Do you need, for example, if we remove an ovary and we don't want to um, rupture the cyst, we can put it into a bag and then take it out that way. Should you maintain the pathologic integrity? Sometimes we don't feel that we have to. Other times, um, specific pathologic diagnosis is very important. So those are things to keep in mind. Should you maintain your minimally invasive approach? How, is, how important is that to you, to your patient? And then obviously, your method of retrieval should be cost and time efficient. Where can you remove the specimens from? So obviously, minimally invasive surgery is, is my specialty. So we often remove specimens from our laparoscopic trocars if it's small enough. If it's not, we can actually take the trocar out and remove the specimen directly from that incision in the body. We can enlarge that incision if we have to by millimeters, even a centimeter. Or we can remove it from the vagina. So for instance, if we're doing a total laparoscopic hysterectomy, we already have a colpotomy. We can remove our specimen through there um, if the size allows us to. If we're not removing the cervix, if there's not already a colpotomy made, we can create one um, if the, the patient's anatomy allows us to. You can make a laparotomy if you haven't already done so. Um, and you can even make that laparotomy small, just a few centimeters, what we call a mini laparotomy. And then when you remove it, you can actually just remove the tissue, what we call bare, um, without any kind of containment system, or you can remove it in what people are calling containment systems, um, but basically what that means is a bag. Um, whether you remove that specimen intact or via morselation usually depends upon what the specimen is and how large it is. This brings us to power morselation, which we'll talk more about. So, hand Morselation is, is the act of, of cutting up tissue, grinding up tissue to remove a larger specimen from a small incision. The first hand-powered mechanical morselator was described in 1991, and in 1993, the electromechanical, what we know now as the power morselator, was described. The FDA approved the first power morselator for GYN use in 1995, and since that time, more than two dozen morselators have been approved by the FDA for use. However, and this number needs to be corrected, four are now available on the U.S. market. It just recently changed. So um, these are the power morselators that are available. Um, the picture um, is the uh, rotocut 
from Carl Stortz. There's the Lena Excise. There's the More Solution from Blue Endo. There's the Plasma Sword, and then there's the Gynecare More Selects from Ethicon or Johnson and Johnson. Two notes: um, all of these morselators are what we would call um, um, kind of electromechanical morselators. They um, act by a spinning, rotating mechanical blade. Um, the plasma sword is actually a bipolar instrument, so it actually um, kind of cuts through tissue using bipolar energy. Advantages to bipolar energy is that some feel, sorry, some feel that there's not the kind of rotational centrifugal force, right, that may fling um, tissue in all directions. However, um, bipolar energy comes with a um, kind of a plume, a smoke cloud, um, so visualization may be hindered at times with the bipolar instrument. Um, also of note, Ethicon, Johnson & Johnson, has, um, they halted their sales of the Gynecare Morselex in April of 2014, and then just last week they actually um, underwent a voluntary recall of their instruments, so they effectively removed the Gynecare Morselex from the market. That's why there's only four available now. So when you morselate, there's a few principles that you should always follow. So you should know what your specimen is, know what you're removing. Um, Usually we remove fibroids, we remove uteruses. Um, is there a, a malignancy in your uterus? You should hopefully know um, with the degree of certainty, and we'll talk about that later, whether or not you suspect malignancy in your tissue. Um, you should also know where your specimen is in place. You should know what's beside of it, what's behind it, what's underneath it. Is the bowel close by? Is the vessel close by? You should also know where your blade is in space. So you should see your blade at all times. Um, you should make sure that it's not too close to the bowel, it's not too close to the sidewall where your vessels are. And hopefully if you know where your specimen is and you know where your blade is, you'll be safe. Um, also, how you use the morselator um, deems whether or not it's a safe or effective process. So historically, uh, morselators, which almost look for lack of a better term, like a, a gun, and then the barrel of the gun would be the morselator that's in the body, um, and the tissue is brought up through the gun. We used to core um, tissue, so we used to put the instrument into the tissue and kind of core chunks out. Um, now it's known that if you use a peeling process, much like you would peel an apple or a potato and kind of go over the surface of the tissue, um, you r remove tissue in a much more effective um, and efficient way. You also have less um, specimen that is lost, kind of pieces and parts that are lost in the process. If you may maintain your pneumoperitoneum, um, it's also safer. So you have to be quick. You have to know how to maintain your pneumoperitoneum. It allows you to have that larger space um, to work within the abdomen safely. And then you should, you know, be conscientious and pick up after yourself. Um, so you want to remove all of the specimens. So if you have little um, pieces of tissue that drop down from the morselation, you want to remove um, all of them if you can. There are several known risks associated with morselation. So if you look at the literature, um, this is from the, a literature review and from the FDA database. Over the past 15 years, only 55 complications have been reported with morselation. And these complications were reported from both GYN surgery and non-gynecologic cases. Um, those complications include six deaths, and they involve injuries to the small bowel, to the vessels, ureters, kidney, bladder. Um, when you look at each case, um, the recurring contributing factor is surgeon inexperience. So um, when you use the morselator, you need to really know what you're doing and know how to use it. Um, so if you take into account that about, up until recently, about 70,000 um, cases annually ex involve the morselator, that comes to an injury rate of 0.02% to 0.07% um, injury rate. Um, you can obviously see by these numbers that there's a gross under or gross under reporting of complications with morselation, so we know that the risk um, is higher. Also, there's a risk of dispersion of benign tissue fragments. So um, obviously, fibroids um, can grow if they have um, the correct hormones. If they have a blood supply, they can grow on virtually anything. So there's been case reports of ectopic uh, fibroids that are, we call parasitic fibroids, um, endometriosis um, that has been disseminated, adenomyosis. So there's um, potential for seeding a cavity with tissue that you don't intend to. Um, this can, can lead to symptoms and can require additional surgery for the patient. And then obviously, um, if there's an occult malignancy or infection, you can spread that. So that brings us to the controversy that we're facing today. I want to go back in time a little bit. So 
think back to October of last year, last fall. So October of last year, I was just starting fellowship. I was like all excited and I wanted to save the world one little tiny incision at a time. I was feeling pretty good about myself. Um, Amy Reed, 40 year old anesthesiologist at Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital. She took care of the Boston bomber and his victims um, during the Boston Marathon bombing. Um, mother of six, just had her sixth baby less than a year before and had been struggling with uterine fibroids for quite some time. They were becoming more symptomatic and she sought out a minimally invasive specialist at Harvard to do her hysterectomy. She underwent that hysterectomy in October and got a call about a week later saying that her fibroids were not benign, but they were lyomyosarcoma. So following that, her and her husband um, became advocates. Um, what they actually did was they called for an all-out ban of morselation, as a morselator had been used in her case, um, and she was told that effectively her, what would have been a stage one um, sarcoma was um, upstaged to even a stage three or four. So the world found out about Dr. Amy Reed through the Wall Street Journal. So the Wall Street Journal article came out in December 18th, 2013, and this was kind of the shot heard around the GYN world. Um, and basically they reiterated Dr. Reed's case and um, stated that the risk of uterine cancer, um, an occult malignancy, and then the spread and the upstage of that by morselation was much higher than we thought and much higher than we were telling our patients. In that article they quoted Dr. Um, Barbieri, I'm saying that wrong, Barbieri, who's the chair of OBGYN at Brigham and Women's, and he is quoted in saying that he had warned. So after um, Dr. Reed's case, they went back and they looked at their data, and they actually found that the rate of occult malignancy at time of uh, fibroid surgery, so that would be myomectomy or hysterectomy, was actually anywhere between 1 in 1,000 to 1 in 400, and that they had warned their staff that the risk is much higher than previously thought. So it's safe to say at this point in time, the GYN world was blindsided. Before we had previously thought the risk of occult sarcoma, um, Lyomar sarcoma, at the time of hysterectomy, or myomectomy was maybe one in 10,000. Then in the past few years, the number had um, risen to maybe one in 1,000. Um, still low risk, even though higher than we thought. Um, however, no one, um, very few people, expected a risk of one in 400. So, um, the professional response to these numbers and to the uh, media attention that started to swirl around uh, the situation was uh, disjointed and was slow, to say the least. So, um, patients are calling, the media is reporting on this, um, it's a good story, um, and gynecologists everywhere are going. Um, the FDA stated that they were going to start to re review their morselation data. And then, um, who comes to save the gynecologist? Um, but the GYN oncologist. So they're the first ones to step in and say, hey, wait a second. Um, you know, maybe we need to take a second look at this. Um, and I'll review the uh, positions um, in detail as we go. So they come out actually in defense of morselation and in minimally invasive surgery, stating that while we should um, evaluate our patients correctly and counsel them correctly, we can't ban morselation just yet. January rolls by and the American Association of GYN Laparoscopy informs their members that they're creating a tissue extraction tax force and they're looking into the situation. However, they make no formal response. Fast forward to April, the FDA then issued um, their safety communication where they strongly, strongly advise um, against power morselation. They say that power morselation should not be used in women who are having surgery for fibroids. So that would be hysterectomy for uterine fibroids and myomectomies. Um, they also um, confirm that they think the risk of occult sarcoma is much higher than previously thought. Finally, in May of 2014, AAGL and ACOG come out with their formal position statements. It basically reiterates what the uh, SGO has reiterated before, say, um, stating the, the um, benefits of minimally invasive surgery, um, but the patients need to be counseled. Um, the risk may be higher than we thought, but um, we shouldn't really throw out morselation altogether. So in response to the professional response saying, wait, 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 just a second, and um, advocates like Dr. Norcasm and, and Dr. Amy Reed saying, you need to ban morselation, the FDA agreed to sponsor a hearing in July, um, and then 
the SGO continues to reiterate its position um, defending more solution. So I'll break this down a little bit um, in a little bit more detail. So in December, the SGO comes out with their statement and basically, again, they say that, of course, we all know, if you suspect or you know that there is a malignancy, it should not be morselated. Um, they say that previously thought the risk was one in 1,000 women. The risk is probably higher than that um, of women who have uh, lyomyra sarcoma or sarcoma um, at the time of hysterectomy or myomectomy. They reiterate, there is no reliable way to differentiate a benign fibroid from a malignant fibroid before surgery. You can only confirm that by pathologic di diagnosis, and actually it's histologic diagnosis. Um, and then they again reiterate that the prognosis for sarcoma is poor. Um, even when the specimen is removed intact, say from an abdominal hysterectomy, um, there's already a poor prognosis. Um, they urge uh, gynecologists to do a proper workup prior to surgery and that they should counsel their patients correctly. Um, they also note that there may be alternatives and we need to evaluate these alternatives such as should we be morselating in a bag or a containment system and then should we be offering laparotomy to certain patients. And then this is just Dr. Zorn on behalf of the SGO. She's quoted in the Wall Street Journal in January um, saying that um, the, the call to abandon morselation altogether is, is basically just jumping the gun. So um, in April, uh, the FDA did issue their safety communication where they said that morselation should no longer be used um, for women um, who are having surgery for fibroids because of the risk. And they quote that risk at the risk of sarcoma is one in 300 to sorry, one in 352 women, and then risk of lyomyra sarcoma is actually one in close to 500, which is, again, much, much higher risk than we previously had thought. So in response um, to the SGO's um, statement in December, The Lancet actually came out in an editorial in February and called their position on morselation soft and actually called for um, either a ban or kind of halting morselation until we know a little bit more about it. In April, Dr. Uh, Goff, who's the president of SGO, responded by saying, wait a second, no, um, minimally invasive surgery has clear advantages and people are kind of losing sight of this. So she cited those advantages and, and for those um, of you, sorry, for those of you um, who may not know, it's been proven that minimally invasive surgery has decreased blood loss than open surgery, decreased surgical site infection, decreased rate of venous thromboembolism, decre decreased length of hospital stay, and decreased recovery time. So there's clear advantages that minimally invasive surgery offer to patients. And sometimes in order to perform minimally invasive surgery, we need to morselate. So, um, the SGO continued to um, reiterate this statement, and in July, after the FDA hearing, they again stood by their statement that morselation has its advantages, and they actually called the FDA's quoted sarcoma risk questionable. So we'll get into the data. So there's pretty strong statements being thrown around. What did AEGL and ACOG have to say? So basically, they kind of reiterated the same thing. So um, again, AEGL created a task force. Um, they called for more education, innovation, and research in this field. Um, and they basically issued their formal response in uh, the beginning of May. It was a 12-page position statement where they outline um, a lot of the history, a lot of the information that we do know on the situation. But they, again, agreed with um, the SGO that um, Morselation should continue. Um, you need to risk assess your patients. You need to preoperatively evaluate them well. You need to counsel them correctly. And you need to uh, pick the patients that you use morselation in um, well. ACOG came out with their formal recommendation one day later and again echo echoed everything as well. So um, people have called the FDA's numbers. Um, correct, people have called it incorrect, um, the SGO called it questionable. So how did they actually get that number, um, that higher risk of sarcoma and lyomyra sarcoma? So basically what they did is they did a lit literature search. Um, they wanted to look at what is the rate of sarcoma in women undergoing a hysterectomy or a myomectomy. So they looked at studies from 1980 to 2011, they found 18. Again, these were cases of hysterectomy and myomectomies. These were cohort studies, cross-sectional studies. And they decided to take their risk analysis 
from nine out of those 18 studies. The reason why they only used nine is they wanted to use the ones that were published in English, and they also wanted to use studies that really only had fibroids as the preoperative diagnosis. So a little information about the studies they used. Nine, out of the nine studies, five were from the United States. Um, they had a sample size that ranged anywhere between 100 patients to a little over 1,400 patients. Um, the risk of sarcoma also ranged greatly. So some papers had a zero rate of sarcoma, and some had a four, four and a half, um, 4.5 rate in every 1,000 women. Again, the rate of Lyomire sarcoma also ranged greatly, anywhere between zero patients to almost five patients in 1,000 patients undergoing the surgery. So the range is, is kind of quite large. Um, the sample sizes vary. Um, and then some things about the um, studies that people are calling into question. So the method of hysterectomy and myomectomy in some of the cases are quite unclear. Um, they some studies included morselation and some did not, um, but the FDA maintains, and, and really their goal was just to see what is the rate of occult cancer in a hysterectomy or myomectomy. So whether or not morselation was included, um, you can debate that fact. Um, but then a lot of the studies that are, that are written in the literature um, are coming from referral centers, um, a lot of times oncological centers. So there might be a referral bias as well that some people point to. So the main criticisms are very few studies, um, sample size is very small, and there might be a referral bias. So what is the real risk? If you do a literature search um, of the recent literature, you see a vast array of numbers, anywhere between one in 1,000 to one in 400 to one in 7,000. Um, of special note, uh, there's an article by Jason Wright, let me just point that out, in 2014, and this actually came out in July. Um, and a lot of people are pointing at this and saying, see, 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 the risk is extremely high. Um, what Dr. Wright did, um, and his group did, they looked at an insurance company, and the insurance company um, accounts for 15% of all um, surgical hospitalizations in the, in the country, and most of these hospitals are located in the southeast. Um, and they looked at all cases of minimally invasive surgery include, that included morselation. And they uh, then looked at the pathological um, diagnosis of these women. And they found that the rate of uterine cancer was one in 376. Um, so that's much, much lower than we previously had thought. However, um, they don't differentiate between type of uterine cancer. So that's sarcomas, endometrial cancers, which we already know the risk of endometrial cancer is much higher than sarcoma. So um, some people are taking this number and touting it as the risk of sarcoma. Um, when that's not exactly the case. Um, so, so I don't know if, if anyone would disagree with me that these numbers, um, they don't really help us come to a very clear consensus. We can agree that it, the, the risk is probably a lot higher than we thought, um, but how we counsel our patients and what number we use it, it can be questionable. The problem with this debate as well, so if you look at the overall ranging debate, is that the benefits of minimally invasive surgery are not really being heard. Um, it's constantly a risk analysis. What is the risk of cancer? What is the risk of spreading that cancer? Um, but no one wants to do like the risk-benefit analysis. So no one is talking about the benefits of minimally invasive surgery. What happens if we stop offering minimally invasive surgery to our patients? How are we hurting them in that respect? And then the true risk of the, the worsened outcome, the upstaging of a sarcoma, isn't clear. So what actually happens if you morselate a sarcoma? What does that actually mean for patients and their prognosis when the prognosis is already so poor? So there's a lot being said. Who is saying everything? Who is listening to what is being said? Who is making the policy? Who is running the show? Is it the clinicians? Is it the scientists? Is it the media? Is it the patients? Is, are the patients running the show? Um, and then how do our patients actually get their information? How do other providers get their, their information? Um, this is um, unclear. So it's everywhere. So Cosmo was running articles. Um, probably the Reader's Digest was running articles. Um, New York Times, The Inquirer, USA Today. I mean, this is just a snippet, and actually these snippets are from February, and there's so many more. You Google 
more salation and you should see the stuff that comes up, including a lot of lawyers' um, <laughs> sites. So, so people are getting their information from a lot of different sources who may not um, know better. Um, so how do hospitals react? What are hospitals saying to their providers and to their patients? Well, obviously, it's understandable that the Boston hospitals were the first one to kind of react to this as it happened quite basically right in their backyard. Um, and they stated right away that they were looking at their um, data and they were warning their um, surgeons that maybe the risk is higher, we should take another look at this. Temple University in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, came out and they were the first one to restrict morselation and minimally invasive surgery. And basically their policy said that if a uterus is a certain size, you have to do X, Y, and Z. Um, and that included if the uterus was greater than 18 week size, you were not allowed to do minimally invasive surgery at all. Um, so why Temple University? That's kind of um, out of the blue. Um, basically, Dr. Uh, Kaiser, who's the Dean, CEO, and Executive Vice President of Temple, um, was actually the Chair of Surgery at University of Pennsylvania when Dr. Norcasm, who's Dr. Amy Reed's husband, trained there. So there's a personal connection. More policy changes quickly followed. So um, the Boston hospitals came out and said, okay, we'll allow power morselation, but it has to be made contained. If you're going to morselate, you have to morselate in a bag. Um, after the FDA came out with their safety communication, power morselation was banned at several institutions, including the Cleveland Clinic and several hospitals up in Philadelphia. Um, and th this literally happened the day after the, the safety communication came out. Um, morselation, uh, the, the actual uh, manufacturers of morselators started to act. So Johnson & Johnson actually halted their sale. They didn't call for a recall until last week. Um, first they halted their sale, and then last week they actually took uh, their morselators off the market and they asked for hospitals to, re to return their products. So um, the controversy keeps building and keeps building and keeps building, and so the FDA did have that summer hearing, um, July 10th and 11th. And basically they um, invited what, what they created as the Obstetrics and Gynecology Device Advisory Committee. They invited a lot of people um, to speak, a lot of people from the um, oncology world, um, surgical world, GYN, uh, GYN oncology world, to come and talk about the risks. They also invited the public and to, to um, weigh in on this as well. Um, and they outlined their goals of the hearing uh, very um, clearly. They wanted to further understand the risk of sarcoma. They wanted to determine what it really means to morselate a cancer. So what is the prognosis for their patients? What are, those, what are those patients' outcomes? They wanted to actually weigh the risk of morselating an occult malignancy, which no one likes to hear, against the benefits that minimally invasive surgery offers to patients. They wanted to discuss alternatives, and they wanted to determine if they should change packaging for morselation devices. Um, so what that means is, should they issue a black box warning? Um, the FDA specifically stated they would not vote on a ban, that they would not recommend a ban. Um, and even though advocates against morselation were calling for one, um, they stated that that would not be the case. So um, during this hearing, Jubilee Brown, who's actually a GYN oncologist at MD Anderson, um, really kind of stood up for the minimally invasive uh, community. And she stated, um, that we're kind of missing the point when we just look at what is the, the risk of occult cancer. Um, she reiterated the mortality rate for a total abdominal hysterectomy is higher than the mortality rate for laparoscopic hysterectomy, even when you count using a power morselator. Using a power morselator. And she used um, the one in 585 prevalence for occult uh, Lagomar sarcoma um, in that calculation. And basically she did um, some statistical modeling and came out with the fact that if you take all laparoscopic hysterectomies and you convert them to maximally invasive open hysterectomies, that would result in an additional 17 women every year dying from their hysterectomy. And that's dying from their hysterectomy not because of um, cancer alone, from um, the complications for, from the surgery. So, what are the outcomes from the FDA hearing? So the, the FDA is actually, um, their official recommendations are still pending. They're taking actually, um, if you want to write to the FDA, um, they're taking uh, responses up until the middle of uh, August. Um, but they came away with the fact that 
Um, again, the actual rate of sarcoma is unclear, um, but higher than we previously thought. Um, they also uh, can continue to advise um, surgeons that they need to um, correctly um, evaluate their patients preoperatively with endometrial biopsies, with ultrasounds, as indicated, and that they have to, they urge providers, you have to inform your patients of the risks of morselation, including the risk of occult cancer, um, and then what that means if that's in fact morselated, including upstaging cancer. The saga continues, so <laughs> just like Dr. McCry, I mean, it's like minute by minute. Um, in the past week, um, two huge uh, medical centers in western Pennsylvania, um, UPMC and Allegheny, um, came out and banned morselation. And um, the reason for that aren't stated clearly, but um, it's probably in response to the fact that Highmark, um, a carrier with Blue Cross and Blue Shield, Blue Cross and Blue Shield has come out refusing to cover morselation. So this is the first insurance um, carrier that is refusing to pay for morselation. Um, Johnson & Johnson has also, like I said before, decided to remove their devices from the market and from hospitals. So there's like the murmurs, of, yeah, high mark. That doesn't just um, affect uh, Western Pennsylvania, it affects Delaware. So what is the verdict? Um, is the reaction against morselation too restrictive? Is it too lenient? So it depends upon who you talk to. Um, in this little, nice little chart, um, I have, most UIN societies would say that, that the take on morselation is much too restrictive. Um, and many GYN surgeons would feel the same. Um, however, that's not quite fair. I'm, many GYN surgeons actually think that um, the response to morselation is correct and maybe even too lenient. But, we're gonna, we're gonna put people in the, in the too restrictive category for right now. Um, as far as the camp that says it's too lenient, uh, of course, Dr. Norcasm um, and his um, advocacy group, um, a lot of patients, um, so if you talk to a lot of patients about you may have cancer and we don't know about it and we might spread it throughout your body, that's a scary thing for patients to, to hear. Um, and you know, besides what they're hearing from their families, I read this article in Cosmo, um, the media is, is <laughs> fanning the fire as well. So um, again, um, let's just talk about what, what are the real morselation risks when it comes to uh, cancer. So how can we predict if a fibroid is cancerous beforehand? Um, we can't, but we do know that there are known risk factors to sarcoma. So maybe um, you may be able to risk stratify your patients. So obviously the risk of sarcoma is increased as patients age. So the mean age of diagnosis for sarcoma is um, between 60 and 70 years of age. Um, if you're a black female, your risk increases to twofold for Lyomyer sarcoma. If you're a patient using tamoxifen for anywhere between two and five years, um, your risk for sarcoma increases. If you've had a history of pelvic irradiation, if you have hereditary leiomyomatosis and renal cell carcinoma syndrome, which is an um, autosomal dominant syndrome, you may be at risk for sarcoma. And then also survivors of childhood retinoblastoma are at an increased risk. So if you take your patient's history and she comes up positive for one of these, you may have to have a conversation. Well, you should have a conversation. Um, and then how do, you how do you evaluate the patient? So of course, again, patient history, um, her age. And then, um, Imaging. So there's some uh, papers and studies that show that there's certain markers on ultrasound, there's certain markers on MRI that may be concerning for sarcoma versus a benign fibroid. Um, but those um, studies have been small, and the um, false positive rate is quite high. Um, also, there has studies been shown that, of course, LDH is elevated um, in the instance of sarcoma at times. So some uh, have said if you pair um, LDH screening with MRI screening, you might come up with a very good screening protocol for sarcoma. Um, however, again, you have a high rate of false positives. So um, you have a high rate of telling people, oh, it looks like you may be at high risk for sarcoma, and then again, it will turn up to be a benign uh, fibroid. So how we use this information is still yet to be determined. Um, and then pathology, right? We know that we need tissue in order to diagnose sarcoma. So um, every once in a great while, you'll get an endometrial biopsy that comes back um, positive sarcoma, but obviously um, a lot of times you can't reach a fibroid within the endometrial cavity. So it's not reliable at all um, to say that there's no sarcoma. Um, also, uh, 
people have suggested that maybe you do a frozen section. So um, prior to morselation, you just take a piece of your fibroid um, and you send it off for frozen section, but that's also been shown not to be reliable as far as um, diagnosis for sarcoma. So um, what happens if you morselate a sarcoma? So um, there was a group that published an article in GYN Oncology in February um, where they looked at their data from 2005 to 2012, and this was um, data from various Boston hospitals, and they found 21 cases of Lyomyris sarcoma, and then, um, oh, I'm sorry, 21 cases total, 15 which were Lyomyris sarcoma, and then six which were stump tumors, um, and they looked at what happened with the patients after morselation. 12 of those patients had re-exploration surgery, um, and they said that this surgery happened immediately. And basically, after their initial surgery, they underwent a second surgery anywhere between 15 to 118 days. Dissemination, um, which is what we fear, right, that would upstage someone from a stage one to a stage three or four, um, happened in 28% of the Lyomyer sarcomas and 25% of those with stump tumors. Um, and the reason why dissemination is so um, important, what people talk about, is the five-year survival rate for sarcoma is not great no matter what stage you have. Um, but obviously, 60% at stage one versus 28 to 15% at stage three and four mean a lot to patients. Um, so wh what exactly does that mean? So when, you're, when your five-year survival rate decreases, what exactly does that mean? So there's two, um, two main studies that, where they looked at do patients do better that have abdominal hysterectomies versus laparoscopic hysterectomies where morselation was used. And the first um, article was by Park and colleagues, and that was in 2011. And basically, they looked at their data over 20 years, and they identified 56 patients with Lyomyris sarcoma of the uterus. 55% of those patients had an abdominal hysterectomy. 45% of those patients had a laparoscopic hysterectomy with morselation. They showed a decreased five-year survival rate, um, overall survival rate, and disease-free survival rate for the patients that had morselation. When you look at the mean time interval from surgery to recurrence, and when it comes to sarcoma, recurrence is um, extremely bad. Um, there's really not that much of a difference. People who were morselated had a 15, or sorry, had a 17-month interval, but people who had abdominal hysterectomy only had an interval that was two months longer. If you look at Serrano and company, um, they d they published a, um, a data in October of 2013, and they looked at 68 patients. Um, 16 of those patients had morselation, 52, per, to 52 of those patients didn't. And they saw a significant decrease in the median time to recurrence in patients who were morselated. They also show almost a three-fold increase in the risk of recurrence in patients who received morselation versus those who didn't. So it looks as if the prognosis is poorer with those who have morselation, and that makes sense. Um, however, we still don't know exactly um, what that means. Um, also, the number of patients, again, the sample size of these studies are quite low, um, so that um, also clouds the picture. So after all of this, what do we do? After this controversy, what, as GYN providers, should we do for our patients? So basically, you need to evaluate your patients properly um, in the preoperative period. You need to get a pap smear, an individual biopsy if it's indicated. You need to do your imaging. Should you get an MRI or not? Um, you need, re need to review their personal history and their family history, and then that helps you risk assess your patients, and it helps you consent your patients. We need to consent our patients correctly. We need to tell them about the risk of occult cancer. We need to inform them with the numbers that we know, and even explain how we don't know the numbers exactly. Um, we obviously need to update our risk numbers. If we're still using the one in 10,000, then we're not right. Um, we need to also explain to them what the adverse events with morselation across the board is, even benign, um, spread of benign tissue, injury to organs. Um, we need to tell them whether or not we plan to use a morselator, and we need to give them options for alternative tissue, remo t tissue removal, including a laparotomy. Should we change our technique? Should we abort minimally invasive surgery altogether? Should we abandon myomectomies? One could argue even in myomectomies, you're disrupting the tissue, you're disrupting the tumor, and you can spread the cancer that way. Should we start to morselate in a bag? 
So just so, um, just for context, this is actually uh, morselating, manual morselation with a knife as a scalpel um, from a laparotomy incision. Um, and they're using actually an Alexis retractor, which is um, a, an incision protection um, retractor um, where there's kind of protection of the tissue with that. Um, I don't know if you can see here, um, plastic is kind of stretched all along the incision. So sh should we do this? Should we morselate in a bag? Do bags, are bags even safer? So, so one would think, of course, bags would be safer. It's, you know, you're putting something in a bag and you're pulling it out, but it can fail. Um, so uh, Dr. Sarah Cohen um, published a report in uh, June of this year, and basically they looked at, um, can the bags leak? They used four different techniques and they use power morselation. So they took a laparoscopic um, box trainer, they took beef tongue, they dyed the beef tongue with indigo carmine. Um, then they used their four different techniques. So they used open morselation where they just morselated at will inside the lap trainer. Um, then they did three different closed morselation techniques. So first off, they used a stitch sealed rip stop nylon bag and there's all sorts of bags that you can use for tissue removal. Um, and they use what they call a multi-port approach. So they actually put um, several ports into this bag, and then they insufflate inside the bag and morselate in the bag. Um, then they used a clear plastic bag and the multi-port approach, morselated in that. And then they used the clear plastic bag again and just use a single site approach. Um, they did each of these four techniques four times. And then they noted whether or not they actually saw leakage. So did they see the blue dye kind of dripping around, spreading around? And then did they see um, evidence of cytology, um, uh, cy cytologic cell by cell spread? So after they removed the tissue, they rinsed out the lap trainers. They sent the, um, the irrigation specimen to cyto cytology and they evaluated whether or not it came back positive for the uh, muscle fibers. And what they saw was they visualized leakage in the stitch sealed ripstop nylon bag one of the four times, so 25% of the time it failed um, on direct visualization and it failed also um, cytology washings that one time as well. Otherwise, um, no leakage um, with gross examination and no leakage via cytology um, for the plastic bag. So maybe it works, um, maybe it's not completely safe, but it might be a, a decent option for us. I don't have time for the video. All right, I have a little video. Um, so, so basically, again, what is clear and what's not clear? So we'll go on to what is clear. There are clear benefits for minimally invasive surgery. There's clear disadvantages for invasive surgery for certain patients. Um, we need more data. We absolutely need more data to be able to risk assess our patients, to be able to better um, inform them and, and better um, practice good medicine. Um, we also need better tissue extraction modalities. So there's a silver lining in all of this, um, and basically it's driving innovation. It's driving us to get better at what we do and um, create better instruments. There's a lot, though, that's unclear. We still don't know what the exact sarcoma risk. There's such a huge range. Um, there are unclear consequences to morselation. What does it actually mean to um, upstage a patient that has a poor prognosis already? Um, the alternative um, of minimally invasive surgery of morselation is, is also unclear. Um, and then the prediction of cancer prior to surgery is, is still unclear. How can we predict cancer um, before we cut it up? So these are my unofficial recommendations. Um, so from your friendly fellow. Um, Remember to get an up-to-date pap smear if you can. If you need endometrial sampling, of course you should do that. Um, get a preoperative ultrasound. If you're concerned with the way the fibroid looks, you might want to get an MRI. Talk to your friendly radiologist. Um, kind of discuss with them if they think that it might be malignant or not. Do you want to get an HDL level? Um, that evidence is still up in the air. Um, and then if a patient is significantly at elevated risk for malignancy, you may want to consider um, no morselation. So you might want to consider, consider alternative tissue extraction techniques or um, just a lap laparotomy. Most of all, all patients should be counseled. You have to counsel your patients. It's only fair. You have to tell them about the risk of malignancy, the risk of morselation, and then um, their options. You need to also counsel them on the risk of laparotomy.
So when I talk about morselation, I tell my patients whether or not I plan to use it. I talk about the risk of occult malignancy and what upstaging might mean for them. I talk about dissemination of benign tissue. I don't kind of forget about all of this other stuff. I, I also tell them about um, the risks of injury to bowel, to bladder, to vessels. Um, we talk about the challenges that it might pose for pathologic evaluation of their tissue since we're removing it in pieces. Um, and then also, um, I talk to them about alternatives of the minimally invasive approach and those risks, which include increased risk of blood transfusion, longer hospital stays, increased risk of postoperative pain, recovery time is increased, and increased risk of venous thromboembolism and wound infections. So thank you so very, very much. Um, that's my awesome daughter and husband. Um, thank you to Dr. Carl Delabedia. He's the um, fellowship director. Thank you so much, Dr. Derman, for having me. Obviously, thank you so much, Dr. Mackay and Dr. Patel. Um, and thank you to all of you who have made me um, write at home for the past nine months. your hard work. Um, there are so many questions that this whole controversy raises. Um, I will share a personal anecdote. I had a 52-year-old in my office last Thursday who has fibroids that are still symptomatic and she's fighting perimenopause. And if I won't morsel it because I'm afraid it's cancer, will I still leave it in her? Right? I mean, you can take this all the way to does every woman who's over 50 with fibroids and symptomatic get a TAH now? Like, I mean, this, this goes so far. So I, I would invite anyone who has questions or comments, um, please, let's have a discussion now. We're taking it tomorrow to our GYM meeting. Yes, Dr. Sassion. So one, that was a great job, especially for uh, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thanks. Two is, you know, I'm an MFA, but where does UAE fit? Uh, yeah, that's, that's a great topic, and, and more and more people are starting to, to talk about that, um, talk about the uh, minimally invasive methods that actually leave uh, the tissue in situ. Um, what Dr. Mackay says, treating medically, um, you put the pa patient on hormonal therapy, you put the patient on, um, you know, Lupron, um, what is the best? If, if we're concerned that the cancer risk is higher than we previously thought, is leaving it in the body any better? So um, I don't have a clear answer for you. I don't know if Dr. Mackay does too, but it's 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 an issue that wasn't really talked about at first, but that keeps being brought up now because this isn't just about morselation. This is if, if we say the risk of sarcoma is higher than we previously thought, we have to look at all ways we treat fibroids. That's the answer. We have to look at everything we do for fibroids. And so again, you want to counsel your patient. So, Counsel your patients is the most important thing. If you're counseling your patients towards Lupron, towards keeping her uterus, if she says, you're not taking this uterus out no matter what, you have to tell her what that means um, to her. You know, it's interesting, part of the counseling, we'll get to that but part of the issue with counseling, why it's being ad nauseum reviewed and repeated, is that Dr. Reed said she didn't know they were gonna use a morselator and she didn't know she could have a cancer. And two, those two things together, she didn't know that if she had a cancer and it was morselated, it would upstage her. This is a Harvard practicing anesthesiologist whose husband is a cardiothoracic surgeon also within the, Har in the Harvard system. With a big fibroid uterus, I would beg her to put Two and two together, she hired a minimally invasive surgeon to get a big thing out through a little incision. And I don't believe she didn't have informed consent, which if you go through like her whole argument and why she's so angry is she didn't have informed consent. And that was her primary issue. Not that she doesn't have a bad cancer and that it was made worse. So the fact that apparently gynecologists weren't telling her patients. So that I mean, it goes to Dr. Hoff. Just allowed to have her anger. Yep, that's right, but maybe place it in the right place. Yes. Um, so just to comment on a question, we've looked internally and we've more solicited over 400 women and have zero cases of any form of cancer, including LMS. Um, the other question, the real question is, is what are the device makers doing? So we've seen J&J &J already stop. Do you think that this device is going to be taken out of our hands entirely? <laughs> 
Oh, that's a really good question. That's a good question. And, and you kind of look and, and everyone's being so quiet. The, the only people who are being very quiet is the industry. Um, and I guess that may be so, right, but yeah. So, so I, I think that um, very unfortunately, politics is playing a huge role. Um, you know, I ran up to Dr. Dermot before Grand Rounds and I was like, have you heard from Dr. Nevin about Highmark Blue Cross? I need to know before we get into this talk. And he's like, well, I've heard from the Wall Street Journal on Saturday. <laughs> so again, um, but no, we haven't heard from hospital administration about what, you know, I don't know who to look to. Is legal going to bring it to me? Is you know, is Dr. Nevin going to bring it to me? Is the, you know, who who is finance going to come and say we're not paying for this device if however many Blue Cross people you know you know in a Blue Cross patient you can't book a laparoscopic hysterectomy? I mean, what's coming next? The um, the fact, truth be told, does anybody remember it was two weeks ago that Dr. Mansuria? an expert laparoscopic surgeon from Pittsburgh, from Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. came and gave a grand on care on laparoscopic hysterectomy. And he specifically asked me, called me out at the end of his question session, um, about what we're doing about morselation because it's such a big deal. And he said, we're still morselating. So when I got the update yesterday that UPMC bans morselation, I was like, well, what's that all about? If you Google it to try and get more information, you get your information from number one on the Google list. Dr. Norcasm's webpage. Number two, Dr. Norcasm's webpage by a second name. Number three, a law firm. Those are the first three, and I Googled it three times to make sure. They came up in different orders, but those are one, two, and three, and not in the yellow box of paid advertisements. Okay? So where do we get our information? I, the Wall Street Journal was like at the bottom, right? Of Wall Street Journal breaks that they banned this. So, so where where do we know? Did UPMC really ban this? Or did Highmark call them and say, hey, do you guys want to take the high road? Because we're about to publish that we're not paying for it. So do you want to get in there and make it look like you're doing the right thing for your patients? I kind of wanted to know that they have a Christianity option, you know? Like, could we have banned it before they said enough? It's just interesting. Who knows? I don't know that UPMC didn't plan to ban it anyway. But I think there are so many things in play. You know, if their major insurance company is not going to reimburse, what's their incentive for banning it? when the FDA is coming out with a recommendation. Yes, Dr. Fink. Well, what kind of numbers are you using and quoting as far as, I mean, there's a difference between a cold carcinoma and a car, why my sarcoma are common. What numbers do you believe, what numbers are you using? So I'm giving my patients two sets of numbers, and I'm giving them two handouts. I give them the FDA statement, so I tell them the FDA says this is high, and I give them, the, I give them either the ACOG or the SGO statement, and I say, the actual doctors don't think it's quite this high, but they think it's certainly higher than we previously thought. Um, and I try, I mean, if anybody's going to give them a bias, I try to be unbiased. If anyone was going to give them a biased approach or biased counseling, I would think it might be me. Um, and I haven't had anyone elect to undergo power morselation since I've been educating them more. I always counsel my patient on a small risk of cancer. When you say one in 400, that seems so real to them. But it really takes it to the next level. I gave a 52-year-old Lupron last Thursday. Was that the right thing? Do I have to tell her there's a one in 400 chance you have a cancer and I'm just prolonging it by giving you Lupron and it's gonna grow and you're gonna get sick. She's had these fibroids for 10 years. She's perimenopausal. So if she wants, it, it's a big uterus, so I'm gonna offer her Lupron, but if she wanted a laparoscopic hysterectomy, I would like to be able to morse like that because I would think we'd know she had a sarcoma or a leiomyosarcoma in 10 years. And the way that the FDA and these societies are phrasing things, it's not gonna let me do the right thing for that patient. I've never met her before, she never knew she had fibroids, it's just 20 fibroid uterus, that's a different risk assessment. But we haven't been able to quantify that in the science yet. You know, Jason Wright's paper, where there was a one in 376 risk of uterine cancer, number one, it did include endometrial cancers. Well, if you can't tease those out, you know, if you've done an endometrial biopsy and it's benign and you've evaluated your patient, I think everybody would agree you would accept some small risk of occult malignancy. And you have to know other factors about the patient. Um, but that study looked at just morselated specimens only, and it, it was a total of 34,000 mm -hmm. procedures that they looked at that were morselated. 27 in 10,000 had a uterine cancer. 27 in 10,000. That's what we're doing all this for. 27 and 10,000. <laughs> Any questions?
Yes. And, um, do you know, and I don't, this is what's frustrating me, is that has anyone really stratified this by age? Right? Because I have, you know, 20 to 40 year olds who want to be pregnant, who have one or two fibroids that are affecting their cavity that can start to come out. Now, do all of them need a lap rod? And I will tell you, I'm talking too much. <laughs> I have come from a couple people. I did one last month, I'm doing another one next month, because they look at me and I said, I want you to go to your I want you to go. I do, now you're supposed to go and move up and then come back to me and tell me what you think because I, you know, your hands are tied, right? And they come up to me and say, please do it. And I say, okay. Good. But it's frustrating because now I might not be able to, right? Mm -hmm. So my 29 year old, 605, does not have a 300 chance. That's absolutely correct. Um, very well done. Um, so if you actually look at, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of objections that I have to the recent uh, Jason Wright article. Um, but but what he actually kind of does well is he actually does risk stratify by age. And I'm sorry, I don't have those numbers for you. Um, but if you look at, it was in JAMA in July, July 22nd, actually, of 2014. Um, and you look at his article, and they actually do kind of risk stratify based on age. And it's exactly what you say. The risk is much, much lower when you're in your 20s, your 30s. It starts to climb as you get into your 40s, your 50s. And then, again, it jumps up to that high risk when you're in your 60s and 70s. So compared with women under 40, and I may not be perfectly right, the odds ratio between 50 and 54 was grossly 5 compared with women under 40. Once you hit 60, I want to say the odds ratio was 15, and if you're over 65, the odds ratio was like 20 or 37. Like they kept, he, he did, went, it's a really nice paper. Um, and he did, so over 50, already your odds ratio was five compared with under 40. But where does that leave us? I mean, who are the, like 40 to 50 bleeding and fibroids, right? I mean, we're going to call this, that's what we see. I mean, so 29, you're right, very low risk. Um, but, go ahead. Yeah, no, no, it's okay, no, and I, I feel like you Feel like you know, with all of our knowledge we have, but but people aren't saying that. See that, but this is and I think it's cynical. But I think the reason is why I don't think these. I mean, of course, you care about the person. It's sad. It's terrible. It's totally horrendous. But these insurance companies and Johnson and Johnson, they don't care. They just don't want to be sued. Johnson and Johnson, hundreds of million dollars of dollars. In why do I want a lawsuit? And that's why it's very easy to do it because these people think that they're taking the high road, but they're not. You know, let's just be honest here. Nobody wants to be sued. Well, I, I, I think you're, you're absolutely right, and those points are so hard to look at. We were talking about on our walk over here from my office, you know, are we really going to let, not that we're not sympathetic to this patient, but are we going to accept upstaging some women with this terrible cancer for what is potentially cost saving? I mean, everybody talks about value, and everyone wanted to crucify the robot for how expensive it was. But if we go back to doing TAHs and having more complications, and potentially higher costs for those reasons for these women, what is that doing in our health system? I mean, who knows? I mean, there, there's some evaluation, there's some common sense that has to be used. Um, but I, I think that the, so many of these questions don't affect just more solutions, but it's how we are going to manage fibroids at all. Yes, that's a moment. Well, I'm going to go there. 
I'm just going to go there and say that the average BMI patient that I operate on is well over 40. And that 16 week year is, there's a reason that I don't refer every patient to Dr. Hoffman, who I understand can get almost anything out to the vagina. But <laughs> sometimes, sometimes you can't. And um, so I have been arduously, anyone who's been in the OR with me lately can sympathize with themselves. Because um, you're putting these giant tumors and these bags, and I have a struggle to be patient with a mini laparotomy. You know, and then take these fibroids out, these small, even small incisions with your coker and your outlet and then a knife and whatever. It is. Dr. Cho is the first person who did one with me. <laughs> right? It was awful. It was a good thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, honestly, I've had to consider in my practice whether or not we want to touch it. Since, since at age 50, it looks like it goes up. Hard to know what goes on in between 40 and 49. And, you know, in a lot of these societies are using age 50 as a cutoff in their statements and their advice. Like, are we going to start talking to 48 year olds and, and being like, if you want your minimally basic hysterectomy, you have to do it in the next two years? Because at age 50, you're going to get a TAH? It's awful. I mean, it's just awful. These are patients that have so much of them start to be telling staff. And suggestions. No, I don't know if there's actually any, um, and I apologize for this, I don't know if there's any um, urogynecologists here, um, but they also raise an important question too because they see patients for pelvic organ prophylax, they do um, super cervical hysterectomies with sacral colpopexy, and they need to morselate the uterus in order to get it out. Um, just because we know that if you place mesh around the cervix, it's better than better outcome than placing mesh around the vagina. Um, but those patients don't have fibroids. Um, so their risk of sarcoma is notably much, much lower um, than what we're talking about. But if the institution has banned morselation, that includes them. So um, their patients are, are affected as well. So there's a whole range of women, just not the women with fibroids, who are being affected by these decisions. They actually came out with a statement that says that they support morselation, especially in incidents such as that. Yep. Who's used a power morse later in the last three months? One. <laughs> Great. After SGO came out and reaffirmed its statement after the July hearings, I had absolutely determined that I was going to go back to using it. <laughs> and then we'll see if my mark blue cross lets me. I mean, most of my patients are not blue cross and shield insured, so for me it may not make a difference. But, um, you know, I, I think that sends a message to the institutions, um, and then the institutions will bring it to us. So. We have a GYN meeting tomorrow night. Hopefully, Dr. German plans at the next business meeting to update the department. So hopefully, you guys will be there. And in the meantime, feel free to email the FDA and tell them, <laughs> tell them you think that, whatever you think. Thank you, thank you.